The defendant is 29-year-old Wade Wilson. He faces multiple charges, including two counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of Christine Melton and Diane Ruiz. These two women were killed within days of each other. Back in October of 2019, Melton was found dead in her home, and Ruiz was found in a field several days later. Wilson faces the death penalty there in Florida in connection to these killings. Is it possible for someone to be a natural-born killer, or is it a learned trait through trauma? It seems like every case is different depending on the details, of course. Today's case is one that genuinely floored me from the start. Being a Florida native, seeing heinous crimes like this in my area really moves my heart. I wanted to cover this case because the media coverage was outrageously insane. I have watched several hours of jail phone calls, court proceedings, and podcasts about this case. With all that information soaked into my brain, here is the disturbing and downright disgusting story of Wade Wilson. On October 7th, 2019, Wade Wilson killed two women, Christine Melton and Diane Ruiz, in Cape Coral, Florida. Wade met Christine for the first time at Buddha, a popular local bar, on October 6, 2019. They would end up partying together, and the next day while she was asleep, he strangled her to death and stole her car. Later that morning, he encountered Diane Ruiz while she was walking to work. He asked her for directions and coaxed her into the car. Once in his car, Wade strangled Diane. When he saw that she had not died, he pushed her out of the passenger seat and he ran her over multiple times with the vehicle. Later that same morning, he also viciously attacked his now ex-girlfriend, Mila Montanez, and tried to drag her into the car. She managed to escape, and somebody called the police. Roughly around 9 a.m. on Monday, Fort Myers police responded to the 2000 block of West 1st Street for a report of a male and a female fighting, according to a probable cause statement. Somebody made multiple 911 calls and callers stated that the male was dragging the female outside of a business. Police said a 36-year-old Fort Myers woman, Mila Montanez, was involved in the altercation and told them that Wade tried to pull her into his vehicle and that as she was about to get away, he got out and started to drag her towards his car. She said he also punched her in the face and bit her ear but she said she was able to escape to a neighboring business. Police say that the woman had multiple injuries, which included road rash on her elbows and arms, scraped knees, a busted bottom and top lip, and a cut elbow. She also told police that Wilson threatened to kill her and that she was in fear for her safety. At around 10 a.m. on Monday, Diane Ruiz was last seen walking to work at the Cape Coral Moose Lodge. When she didn't arrive by her scheduled time, her co-workers called the police, worried about their friend and co-worker. Police immediately issued a missing person alert. Um, it was a normal business day. Um, I was just uh, dealing with clients that morning. Did there come an occasion when you came into contact with uh, Mr. Wilson? Yes. Would you please describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how that came about? Uh, Wade uh, came in in a black car. Uh, he, he backed up to uh, one of the buildings um, on the property there, and he came up to uh, my truck, my vehicle, when I was on the property, and uh, I was with a client at that time, so I, I told him to uh, give me a moment, and I'll be right with him. And uh, once I went into the building, he was there uh, trying to get a plane ticket or a bus ticket or, or whatever he could from me to... Uh, leave town. Now, when you saw Mr. Wilson, could you please describe for us what he was wearing at that time? Uh, he was wearing uh, sweatpants only, no shoes, no shirt. Um, he was bloody, and he was missing a couple of teeth. At around 8 p.m. on Monday, the Cape Coral Police Department contacted a witness named Joss Luckage. He reported that Wilson had arrived in a black vehicle and confessed to stabbing someone. The police established a perimeter and searched for Wilson but could not locate him. Later, they discovered he was hiding at a residence in the 2000 block of Northeast First Terrace. When the police spoke with the homeowners who were out of town, they confirmed that no one had permission to be in the house. 
the police then called a landline inside the home and spoke with Wilson. According to the affidavit, he mentioned that he needed to talk to his father and then he would come out of the house. On that same day, Cape Coral police investigated a suspicious death in the 4800 block of Tudor Drive, Cape Coral. The deceased was identified as Christine Ann Melton, aged 35. The police continued searching for Diane and even brought in dogs on Wednesday to search the area around the German American Social Club off Pine Island Road around 1.30 p.m. on Thursday. While searching for Diane, Cape Coral police found a body near her home, and on a Friday, they confirmed that it was indeed her. I answered the phone, and um, he said, uh, Hey, Dad, uh, I need some help. Well, I automatically thought, you know, he needs a hotel, he needs money, yeah, yeah. For whatever. So I, you know, it was a hot day. I was frustrated. I said, listen, call me around dinner time. I'll be done working. Just call me then. We'll figure it out. So he calls me. He just, he's in a panic. You know, I could tell he's, I could tell he's high. He, he's, I, I need help. I've done something I can't take back. You know, there's two people that aren't with us anymore. And, you know, and, and my first thought was, oh God, here we go. You know, I just thought he was on one. We talked for a few minutes. I said, listen, I'm on my way home. I said, call me back tonight and we'll figure it out. You know, I said, are you safe where you're at, where you are? And he said, yeah, I'm good. I'm in the house. I'm good. I said, all right. So in the meantime. And he's already told you about taking two people out. Yeah, but that's it was general. That's all he said, you know, and he didn't say, you know, he just said, I've done something I can't take back. When Wade Wilson's father, Stephen Testaseca, spoke with his son, Wilson immediately confessed that he was a killer. And because Wilson is known to exaggerate and has a history of drug abuse, Stephen, who was at work at the time of the call, told Wilson to call him back later in the evening when he had more time to process this. At least two other calls followed that we know of. It wasn't until about 10 p.m. when Stephen began to think that Wade might be saying the truth and is not on some sort of drug delusion. Stephen said Wade confessed to choking Christine after she fell asleep. Wade then admitted to stopping Diane for directions before he somehow convinced her to get into the car, and he choked her while he drove. According to Stephen's testimony, Wade claimed Diane was still breathing before he pushed her out of the vehicle and repeatedly ran her over. He was excited, Stephen said, adding how his son wanted to make Ruiz look like spaghetti. He wanted me to feel the same way he was, Stephen said. That really freaked him out. But what really freaked him out the most was Wade did not show any remorse. Stephen said he initially wanted to help his son. But his perspective changed when Wade began delving into detailed recounts of the slayings. Luckily, Stephen's better judgment took over, and he called the police. Stephen asked Wade for his location and told him he would send an Uber to his location to get him. Instead, Wilson's location was relayed to police and he was arrested on October 8, 2019. Once in custody, things began to get even more interesting when Wade entered Lee County Jail. You, no, you try me. Questions, you so try me, bro. Questions. You try me, Dad. Always. How did I try you, You Wade? know, it's so dumb. You always try me. You don't want me to have anybody in my life. You're... That's crazy. You want to just kick, every, you wanna kick everyone out on my life, bro. Wade, save that shit. Don't get on fucking TV talking about, I'm a God-fearing man, and I've got two little kids. You haven't asked me one time about your fucking kids. Not one time. Now you're on fucking the media talking about your God-fearing, and I've got two kids? You're a dumbass because your stupid ass did what you did. Your stupid ass admitted it, and now your stupid ass is on TV claiming you're innocent. You dumb bitch. Oh, well. Now your stupid ass is put it out on TV. Hey, look well, how... Guess what, you stupid look, look ass. How, look how when You're I call you out. With that. Look how when I call you out, how you, you snap. You see out. what I'm saying? You know what you call When I call you out, when I call you out, you show your cards. You show your cards, Dad. You stupid ass kid. You show your cards, Dad. You control his anger. You show your cards. You bitches. And now, now, you're fucking claiming you need 8000 for legal. You know how much money it would cost to defend your ass? On murder charges? 
What do you well, think the state attorney thinks? I guess it's a good thing I haven't. I guess it's a good thing I haven't been. Interviewed I guess it's a good thing I haven't been charged with murder then, huh? Confession. I guess it's a good thing I haven't been charged. No, you will be, unfortunately. You will be. And now, Wade, you're gonna wear it because your dumbass can't keep your mouth shut. Oh well. You what, baby? Please insanity. Please or something. What? Wrong with you. What are you? Can you hear me? Please insan. Please insanity. Huh? What, baby? Please, please insanity. Please. I am. Insanity. No, baby. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to, baby. That's 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 what I'm doing, baby. I'm going to. I might still, baby. There might still be a chance for me. I'm not done yet. That's what I was. I'm not. I'm not done yet, just yet, baby. Listen, I have people. I have people like contacting me on that machine, trying to like message me and stuff you're, on there. You're fucking Ted Bundy right now. Apparently so. You know, <laughs> there's gonna be two things that happen. One, they're gonna find me not guilty by reason of insanity. Okay. Or, two, they're going to fucking kill me. We, the jury, signed by a vote of 9 to 3 that Wade Wilson should be sentenced to death. Wade was not only fighting two counts of first-degree murder. He had grand theft, battery, burglary, petty theft, and various other smaller charges under his belt at the same time, being found guilty for all of them. Now, the jury did say they voted in favor of the death penalty, but until, I believe, August 27th, so later this month, we won't know what the judge decides. If he is sent to death row, he will be yeeted over into somewhere in central Florida with a bunch of other death row inmates. There's about 300 of them there, and uh, usually it takes about 20 years for them to execute somebody. They really don't take any, like, real speedy uh, routes when it comes to this in Florida, um, I was looking at some averages. It's like there's people that are sitting in there since the 80s still. So uh, if a good old wager kiss here, as uh, Jumpsuit Pablo likes to call him in his videos, um, if if he if he does get sentenced to this death penalty, he will likely be spending a majority of his time alone, um, probably absolutely bored to tears, no no way to really interact with people, very little contact with the outside world. But uh, I think he'll be fine. His commissary seems like it's fat. There's tons of women that have been sending in letters and even men in the process here. And uh, I will probably do a part two when the sentencing actually comes through where I go into a lot of the prison calls, a lot of the uh, other behind-the-scenes stuff that I showed a little bit in here. But with that said, we're going to end this one here and hopefully revisit it soon. A quick disclaimer before this episode. Many of the names are Mandarin and Cantonese. I did my best to try to get the pronunciations correct, but I'm sure I butchered quite a few of them. Please forgive me. On May 16th, 1997, a 999 call was made from Hong Kong's Kowloon District. The caller was a middle-aged man who incoherently told the operator that he was seriously injured and needed an ambulance to bring him to the hospital. He then hung up after a series of barely intelligible words. The ambulance arrived 30 minutes later and rushed him to the United Christian Hospital in Kuang Tong District. At the hospital, the man was delirious and unable to explain where his injuries came from or even the injuries at all, just that he was injured. After a doctor examined him, he noted several bruises and fractured bones likely from a beating prompting the doctor to inform the police. Police spent several hours questioning the man in the hospital until they finally learnt his information. The man lived in an apartment building in Kwan Tong District and was identified as 36-year-old Chan Muk Ching and he worked as a sanitation worker at the time. Chan did not know for sure who had attacked him and he could only identify two of them by nicknames, A B and A Chick. These two people lived in the Sao Mao Ping estate, which is across the street from the payphone Muk Ching called the police from. At 12 a.m. on May 17th, police rushed to the apartment to track down and question those two mentioned previously. 
Now, while the one known as a chick was nowhere to be found, they did find and were able to arrest a B whose real name was Shi Jian, a 16-year-old student. Several accomplices were also detained. The police only made the arrest to question them over Muk Ching's beating, but all those questioned seemed to have a different idea and confessed to something much more, uh, horrifying. All of those arrested were under the age of 18, and yet in spite that they were all gang members and identified themselves as something called triads. In my research for this story, I did have to do a little bit of digging into what the triads were. Now I've heard the name thrown around, I've seen some movies with them mentioned, but I never really knew what it was. And unlike something like the Yakuza, the triads have a bit more of an overtly political origin. Meaning that instead of just being, say, organized crime or something along the mafia, these groups have more higher ambitions, if you will. The oldest and leader, a chick whose true identity was 17 year old Hu Chi Wai, who, like Muk Ching, was employed as a cleaner. Hu Chi also had a record. As in 1996, he was sentenced to one year imprisonment for a petty assault. He also frequently rallied up others to quote unquote go to war and fight and beat up other teen gangs. Most of them also had records for other petty crimes and the police found reason to visit Sao Mao Ping several times before this case. Muk Ching was attacked by the gang as while on shift working and cleaning in the area, he would attempt to persuade others to leave the gangs and continue their education to try and better their futures. Hu Chi Wai saw this as a problem, but violence wasn't his first choice. He would start by trying to intimidate him and in other times using his female friends to try and seduce Muk Ching in hopes that this would motivate him to stop. Hu Chi would also set small fires in the area to further intimidate him, but Muk Ching never gave up. And even more aggravating, his words were actually reaching other gang members. Most notably, 15-year-old Luk Chi Wai seemed genuinely eager to change his ways and leave the crime world behind. He only seemed to be in the gang for the relationships with others and was always reluctant to get involved in criminal activity. Instead, he would prefer to stay back with Muk Ching and help him with his cleaning work and duties. On May 12th, Hu Chi didn't want to do his part-time job simply out of laziness. And while he was inside, Muk Ching ended up meeting his mother and explained to her what her son had been up to. And she was shocked. She then told his father, and both of his parents were outraged and scolded and chewed him out. Hu Chi paid them no mind until later that afternoon. Once they left, he gathered up a bunch of friends. He found Muk Ching on his shift, and then they rushed towards him. They spent two hours beating him. Once this was over, Luk Chi found out what happened and rushed toward him after everyone left to tend to his wounds and even tried encouraging him to contact the police. Two days later, on May 14th, Hu Chi heard of this encounter. They were all angered at Luk Chi's actions and thus sought to make him pay for his quote-unquote backbone. At 9 p.m., he was allured into the exact apartment of Sao Mao Ping where the other members stayed. Hu Chi couldn't take part due to family and personal issues at the time, so in his place, 17-year-old Fu Hin Chun orchestrated the beating. Hin Chun, in 1993, was sentenced alongside another involved 17-year-old, Mac Kaho, to one year of behavior therapy and treatment for a robbery. Others involved were 14-year-old Zhu Jiang, 16-year-old N Ming Chung, who was also in a 1993 conviction for theft, 14-year-old Ron Kit Yi, 16-year-old Chan Tok Ming, who had also had a 1995 conviction for his involvement in a street fight, 14-year-old Li Piai, 14-year-old Wong Kam Po, and 14-year-old Zhu Zhen Chen Kang Go, 
were all involved. There were several other names as well, but to save me and everybody listening to this video, I'm not going to try to say everybody's names. Once Luke Chi arrived, the beating started in full force immediately. They attacked him with their hands and feet before escalating to folding chairs like WWE. Once Yu Chi was done and his family issues, he had returned home and once he saw that the beating was still going on half an hour later, he joined in on the beating. Luke Chi was getting beat with a plastic pipe at the time. They continued for three hours until Luke Chi finally passed away from his injuries. All those involved suddenly became scared and fearful as despite their lengthy list of crimes, this was the first time they had ever murdered someone. Some wanted to call the police themselves and turn in themselves, while others suggested finding a black market doctor to see if they could resuscitate Luke Chi. Hu Chi and Hin Chun calmed everyone down and eventually they settled on carrying the body to an abandoned building while others went out to purchase gasoline. Another member of the group suggested disposing of the body in the mountainous areas to be scavenged by wild animals or a landfill to go undiscovered. Acting under Hin Chun's orders, they removed the now burnt clothes from the body and tied it up with bed sheets and wires. Afterwards, Hu Chi and Chan Tak went out to talk and look for a cart to use to transport the body. But coincidentally, a police patrol happening in the area stopped them. During this time, according to Muk Ching, they were seriously injured and hiding in his home, too afraid to go to the police due to Luke Chi being nowhere to be seen and the rest of the gang threatening him. Due to that well-timed police patrol, the gang had to delay disposing Luke Chi's body, but this time was used to purchase some acid and other tools needed to hinder identification and move the body as well as think of a possible new plan. In the moment, they placed the corpse into a cardboard box which they then sealed shut with tape. They put a bunch of items and belongings into the box so it would look like they were disposing of garbage. They lifted the box into a cart and began moving it towards the apartment's garbage disposal room. The specific block of the apartment they picked was due to be demolished soon, and most of the residents had already moved out, so they figured the body would still be undiscovered as well as what they did to it. Once they arrived, Hin Chun had others act as lookout and pretend to carry furniture on the off chance that someone else came by. They then poured acid and gasoline onto his body before setting it on fire. Afterwards, they waited outside for two hours or more until the fire naturally burnt itself out. Once that had finally happened, they stuffed the body back into the box and waited for a garbage truck to come and carry it off to the landfill, which is what eventually happened. The next day, on May 16th, was when Muk Ching called the police which ended up leading to this murder being exposed. Some members of the gang on that same day had felt guilty and went to their other non-gang member friends who they knew to try and confess and turn themselves in, but nobody would believe them and thought that they were just trying to build up some reputation by telling a fake story. Once all was said and done, the police were absolutely floored since they never even knew Luke Chi was missing and only arrested them to talk to them about Muk Ching's, you know, assault. But instead, they all confessed to this other murder with little to no prompting from them. In fact, the police struggled to even believe them likewise, thinking that they were probably just lying to build up infamy. Adding to their skepticism was the inconsistent nature of their confessions, with some trying to claim that others did it alone and dragged them into it, and others sharing the blame entirely with the team. Pretty much they were hearing 20 different excuses as to why everybody involved wasn't really responsible. Regardless, the police were obligated to investigate so they headed to the garbage room in that block of the apartment. Police found two plastic pipes, a folding chair, a white blanket, a red bucket, a white gasoline barrel, an electric fan, and a pile of charred debris and signs of a fire. But due to the lack of any human remains at the scene, they still couldn't determine that someone had been killed there. 
The police afterwards went to the local landfill and deployed 120 officers and four sniffer dogs who spent six hours searching. But after scouring through several hundreds of tons of garbage and waste, no trace of Luke Chi's remains were actually found anywhere. On May 18th, Hin Chun was arrested after his parents compelled and forced him to turn himself in. Hin Chun confessed as well as confirmed to the police that everything said by the others was in fact the truth. Forensic officials combed through the garbage room and extracted some traces of human tissue from the charred debris and objects, but unfortunately, there was way too much damage to use any sort of reasonable information from that DNA, but they were able to identify that the DNA did belong to a child or teenager and naturally the cause of death was impossible to determine based on this alone. This was enough evidence for the police to know that a murder had taken place and on May 20th, every single one of those teenagers were charged with the murder of Luke Chi despite his body remaining missing. The trial for this case proved to be very challenging. Due to the lack of a body and contradicting confessions from everybody and also many of them later recanting those confessions, it made it really hard for the police to figure out who was the leader and what blame belonged where. Now, Shi Jian was granted immunity to murder charges as long as he offered testimony against everybody he was friends with in that group who participated in this murder. Muk Ching was also not able to testify or do much here because mental issues he suffered from the attack made him unable to testify in court. Somewhere around 9 p.m. on May 14th, Muk Ching was called to come to the apartment via a phone call wanting to discuss something with him. After entering, Hu Chi and a couple of assailants were all waiting. Within seconds of him entering, Hin Chun and other assailants instantly began to punch him and kick him, forcing him onto the ground, shouting at him to confess and beg them for mercy. Hin Chun then got a folding chair and opened it to place the legs over his head to stop him from moving. Then he grabbed a pair of nunchucks and repeatedly kept hitting him with it, screaming questions at him such as, Why did you betray us? But no matter what answer Hin Chun responded with, they just hit him again. Afterwards, Hin Chun was crying out for help when others would pick up his legs holding him upside down with his head pointed towards the ground and repeatedly slam the top of his head against the floor in a move they referred to as a human pile driver, very similar to The Undertaker's finishing move which he used throughout his illustrious career in the WWE and WWF. If you're not familiar with this, I will show something on screen. Once they were done, he quickly collapsed to the ground but things weren't over quite yet. Chan Tak Ming forced a bunch of dates into his mouth while Jin Bao, Zhu Jun, Shi Jian, and others showed up having not been present for most of the beating. This is also when Luke Chi was given a brief break while somebody named Lin Chun told him to get up and start cleaning and mopping around. Obviously, after being beaten pretty profusely, this would be quite a interesting task to undertake. While doing this, though, a female, somebody who apparently went to school with the boys, claimed that Luke Chi had humiliated her, had humiliated her at school. So, she slapped him, and then another boy hit him with an umbrella to show support. This riled up everyone up again, prompting the whole group to jump in and attack him. Now, the brutality unfortunately did not stop there. Another one of the boys would hit him very hard in the back and neck to force him down to his knees with a wooden stick. He would then put him in front of a statue of Guang Gong to repent. Hu Chi and Chan Tak also repeatedly beat him with their own wooden sticks while doing this. Somebody else was trying to punch him and kick him at the same time. By now, his body was so bruised all over and his feet were starting to bleed and they just weren't letting up. This is when they decided to play some sort of poetry recital type game, at least that's what I think this translation means. Basically, one of them would be called by their nickname and then they would repeatedly punch and kick Lai Chuck on their own. So this essentially means that pretty much every single person in that group at the time, maybe excluding one or two, got to at least beat him individually at least once. 
They had tired themselves out and started to smoke and, once they were done, three or four of those involved stuffed the cigarette butts into his mouth. By now, he could barely move and had begged for mercy and that he wouldn't do anything more and would never betray anybody again and that he couldn't go on any much longer. But that's when somebody took him to the bathroom to wash his face and once they returned, somebody was trying to argue on his behalf and convince them that Luke Chi had suffered enough. A bunch of people tried to force him to kneel again and apologize in spite of him having already done so several times. He knelt down, but before he could even speak, another person suddenly kicked him right in the face while somebody else hit him with a folding chair. Now at this point, I'm sure you're wondering how much further could they possibly take this without just killing the poor guy? And I have that same opinion. Now, I know I've made some comparisons to the WWE, but really, hitting somebody with a steel chair, folding chair, whatever, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. It's almost as if they thought this was some sort of video game and treated it like that. Now, at this point, most of the group had left, whether it was from fear of being caught, not wanting him to actually die on their own time, or just leaving because they had something else to do, who could really say? I can say, from what I understand, two people returned back, and they had pipes with them. Plastic pipes again. At some point, they were worried about him looking bad, so they would wash him up in the bathroom, put his clothes back on, and try to get him to walk out. From what I can understand, they were getting a bit angered because he was not able to walk on his own, and at this point, it was clear that he was likely going to die from the beating he had sustained. So... To take this issue into their own hands, I can almost bet you know what they decided to do. They caught up another friend, all three of them came together with plastic pipes, and they beat him absolutely mercilessly until he was lifeless. Their only response after he passed out was to try to drag him to the bathroom once more, pour more cold water all over him to wake him up so they could continue to beat him more. When he passed out, he never woke up again. And this happened at least two or three times that I know of. They didn't realize that he had died until about 12.30 a.m., where they then proceeded to dispose of his body in the manner described above, where they burned him and then threw him out like garbage. Now, as mentioned earlier in the story, one of the witnesses and people who partook in this, Shi Zijin, had testified with immunity. Once the trial began at the Hong Kong High Court, the main question was how accurate his testimony would be, especially when it came down to who delivered the final blow. The prosecution called upon their own doctor to refute. He argued that the material, length, and hardness of the plastic pipes were not enough to cause fatal wounds, and whatever killed Luke Chi likely happened earlier, and it took him some time to die as a result from it. The doctor testified that it wasn't one single blow that called Luke Chi's death, and instead, all the injuries accumulated and resulted in a hemorrhage, meaning that all the participants shared culpability. It was even argued that he may have still been alive, but with a weak pulse while they were putting his body in that box to dispose of. The judge sided with the prosecution and argued that all involved, except the one with immunity, would be charged with murder regardless of how mild they were in any of the assaults. Now, on January 27th, 1999, the jury returned with their verdicts. Hugh Chi was found guilty of murder in preventing the burial of a body and was given a life sentence. An appeal court reduced the sentence to 30 years and then later 25. Ma Ka Ho was convicted of the same charges and sentenced to 26 years imprisonment. He appealed his sentence and in May of 2001, the appeal court convicted him only of assault and preventing the burial of a body and was given a reduced sentence of only seven years. N Ming Chun was given a life sentence, although an appeal reduced it to 25 years. Ruang Kichie was convicted of assault and preventing the burial of a body and was given 42 months in prison with time served factored in. Now, there's a bunch more names involved and they all got very similar sentences. None of them really got more than 20 to 30 years, and then most of them appealed down to probably about 15 or less. Uh, the sentences were all appealed, like I said, and most of them were accepted because the defense lawyers and presiding judge neglected sentencing guidelines for those who were juvenile at the time of the offense. So, even though they did get some time, I don't think true justice was served here. 
All have since been released and are now free with the exception of one who committed suicide jumping off a building in December 25th of 2007. To this day, Luke Chi's body has never been discovered, and his disappearance would have likely remained unsolved if Chan Muk Ching had not gathered the courage to call that 999 call that day. What's up everybody, I am back again looking into another rather recent and trending crime case. Since you guys seem to like the Wade Wilson series so much, I figured I would try to jump on these more popular and more recent cases, especially ones that are going through testimonies and all the fun stuff that court brings along with that, so we can stay on top of these stories and give you fresh updates multiple times a week. Anyways, today's story is another disturbing one. Not quite on the Wade Wilson level of disturbing, but this one is just as messy. This is the strange and downright disturbing story of Karen Reed and the murder of John O'Keefe. On a frigid February night in 2010, a grim discovery awaited the town folks of Canton, Massachusetts. The quiet community accustomed to the whispers of snow underfoot and the stillness of winter would soon be shaken by a tragic story that would evolve into a haunting murder case embroiled in controversy, heartbreak, and mystery. John J. O'Keefe III, nicknamed JJ or Johnny, was born on December 8, 1975. John grew up in Braintree, Massachusetts and graduated from Braintree High School and Northeastern University. He earned a master's degree in criminal justice from UMass Lowell, and he lived in Canton since 2014, where he was helping raise his niece and nephew following his sister and brother-in-law's deaths, tragically. John spent 16 years on the Boston Police Department force. In that time, John got to work with somebody known as Pat Rogers, who was featured on the reality television show Boston's Finest. Boston's Finest is an American reality TV series which aired on TNT and chronicled the daily operations of the Boston Police Department. The series went on from 2012 to 2013 and unfortunately only had about two seasons under their belt before it was cancelled. This is only brought up because Pat Rogers at the time was dating somebody known as Laura Sullivan who had a kid with him and was also longtime friends with John. Now, Laura would meet Karen A. Reed, who will become very important later in this story, and eventually would introduce her to John. They would start talking and subsequently kick it off and start dating. Now, a little bit of information about Karen Reed. She was born in 1980, grew up in the Taunton, Massachusetts area, and also lived in Blacksburg, Virginia for some time. She graduated from Coyle and Cassidy, a private Catholic school in Taunton, and went to Bentley University where she graduated with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in finance. She had been a financial analyst at Fidelity Investments since 2007 and was an adjunct professor at Bentley University. Karen lived in Mansfield at the time of John's death. John and Reed began dating sometime in 2020, like we mentioned. That brings us to the night of January 28th, 2022. John and Karen visited two bars in Canton, C.F. McCarthy's and Waterfall Bar and Grill. At the second bar, they met up with several acquaintances, including fellow police officers Brian Albert. Shortly after midnight, Brian Albert would invite a group of people, including John and Karen, back to his home on Fairview Road in Canton. The two would drive to the house in Karen's SUV, and this is where Karen claims to have dropped John off in front of the home and left because she wasn't feeling great. This is when a snowstorm hit Canton in the early morning of January 29th. Karen reported that when she woke up the next day, John had not returned home. After he did not respond to calls or text, she contacted an acquaintance from that night, Jennifer McCabe, who agreed to join her and another woman, Carrie Roberts, in looking for John. The three women returned to Fairview Road in Roberts' vehicle. 
where they saw O'Keefe lying unresponsive in the snow. Karen exited the car and began CPR. McCabe called 911 at approximately 6.04 a.m. and Canton police, fire, and EMS responded to the scene. John was transported to Good Samaritan Hospital in Brockton, where he was pronounced dead. A medical examiner later reported that John had abrasions to his right arm, several lacerations to his face, two black eyes, and skull fractures, which would have contributed to his brain bleeding. Now, while they did determine that hypothermia was a contributing factor to John's death, they recognize that that is not the entire reason John died that night. Karen theorizes that John was beaten inside the home and his body was left outside. However, there are 11 witness statements that say otherwise and also point to John never even entering the home. This is where the investigation truly begins to get interesting and a bit spicy. Massachusetts State Police Trooper Michael Proctor of the Norfolk State Police Detective Unit was the lead investigation for this case. He produced a series of written reports to Detective Lieutenant Brian P. Tully of the Massachusetts State Police. Now, according to police, pieces of a cocktail glass and patches of blood were found alongside John's body. They also found pieces of a broken taillight, which were said to match a broken light on Karen's car. It wouldn't be until February 1st of 2022 that Karen would be arrested. Her phone was taken into custody. She was charged with manslaughter, motor vehicle homicide, and leaving the scene of a collision in the Lower Staunton District Court on February 2nd. Karen's attorney presented a theory that implicated Brian Albert, who owned the home outside of which where John was found dead. They also tried to bring in his sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe, who had been drinking with Karen and John on January 28th and helped Karen find John's body the morning of January 29th. Evidence showed that Brian Albert sold his house and got rid of his dog after the incident, and Jennifer McCabe made a Google search, which was along the lines of how long to die in the cold at 2.27 a.m. In November 2023, several residents of Canton voted to mount an independent investigation into the town's police department. In January 2024, letters between the general counsel of the Department of Justice and Norfolk District Attorney Michael W. Morrissey were released, confirming a federal investigation was mounted into the Norfolk District Attorney's office. In March 2024, the Massachusetts State Police launched an internal investigation as well into the lead investigator in the case, Trooper Michael Proctor, due to the potential violation of department policy, but have not said whether that investigation relates to a specific case yet. On February 2nd of 2022, Karen was arraigned in Staunton District Court on the charges of manslaughter, leaving the scene of a serious accident and motor vehicle homicide. She pleaded not guilty and was released on an $80,000 bond. In June of 2022, a Norfolk County grand jury indicted Karen for second-degree murder, motor vehicle manslaughter, and leaving the scene of a collision. On March 12, 2024, Karen's attorney filed a motion to dismiss the case due to alleged conflicts of interest in federal crash reconstruction experts determining that John's injuries were inconsistent with the damage to Reed's car. The judge denied the motion on March 26 due to extensive evidence supporting the indictments, such as John's DNA being found on the broken tailgate of Reed's car. In early April 2024, just ahead of the trial date, the prosecutors filed a couple of motions, mainly requesting special restrictions during the trial to keep the media circus at bay. There was also motions that were trying to get passed that would prohibit anyone in the courtroom to wear any attire that says free Karen Reed or anything like that. The judge approved a few requests, including the t-shirt thing, but the judge would say trying to keep people away, such as the media and whatnot, was a bit excessive. Obviously, there has to be a balance. There is the right to protest or demonstrate the defendant's right to a fair trial, but you also have to, you know, try to keep the circus down to a minimum, of course. Now, 
Karen's trial was first scheduled to begin in March 2024, but was rescheduled to April. The trial wouldn't start until April 16th, with the jury selection taking a little bit longer than expected and going all the way to April 24th. Now, prosecutors previously asked the judge to block Reed's lawyers from arguing that the others are to blame for John's death, also known as a third-party culprit defense. The judge instead offered the defense a chance to develop their argument through relevant, competent, admissible evidence, but still barred them from using third-party culprit defense during opening statements. On July 1st of this year, after about 25 hours of deliberation, the jury was unable to come to a unanimous decision. Now, the judge would declare a mistrial, and the Commonwealth does plan to retry the case. Now, when that case will be retried, we will definitely keep you updated and continue to add to the stories. Now, there is a lot of information I definitely want to jump into when it comes to the police, first responders, the O'Keefe family, and witnesses at the bars so we can get a better idea of exactly what went down that night. The O'Keefe family would take the stand for the prosecution. They would describe the relationship between John and Karen. Now, Paul, which I believe was John's brother, actually acknowledged that there have been several arguments between the two. Nothing too crazy and nothing too violent that he had witnessed, but Aaron O'Keefe, John's sister-in-law, would say that she actually considered Karen a friend. When asked about the day when John died, Paul recalled seeing Karen in the hospital screaming, asking if John was alive while she was being restrained by hospital employees. Now, obviously, this could be a distraught girlfriend who just found her dead boyfriend. Or this could be, you know, a little bit of acting to make themselves look a lot less guilty. Canton Police Officer Steve Seraf, the first responder to the house in the crime scene, testified that Karen appeared to be giving John CPR and was visibly upset, repeatedly asking if John is dead and saying, this is my fault. The defense pointed out that Officer Seraf's initial report did not include what Karen said, but included the statement when he testified to the grand jury in April 2022. Defense attorney Alan Jackson argued that not including the quote, this is my fault in the initial police report was an important omission. Now, four paramedics testified and told the court that Karen was saying, I hit him repeatedly at the scene. Canton Police Lieutenant Paul Gallagher, who was in charge of preserving the crime scene that day, testified that he and two other sergeants used a leaf blower to remove the snow and collected DNA evidence with uncovered Solo cups and put them in brown paper grocery bags. They also claimed that it was not standard practice to do so. Canton Police Sergeant Sean Good testified that upon arrival at the scene, he observed the area, noting at least 4 inches, roughly 10 centimeters, of snow and some pink spots which were possibly blood. He also mentioned they improvised methods of evidence collection using leaf blowers, solo cups, and grocery bags. Officer Good would also mention that they did not initially find the broken taillight glass, which was eventually found by John's body, and they also did not locate his missing shoe for some time. Now, a little bit more interesting stuff here is the medical and forensic expert reports. Richard Green, the forensic expert that testified on this case, said that John's Apple Health data from January 29, 2022 showed that he traveled 87.4 meters and took 80 steps between 1221 and 1224, and he was also on three flights of stairs between 1222 and 1224 a.m. Green also testified that Jen McCabe's Google search did in fact happen at 227 a.m. Justin Rice, who was the emergency room doctor who treated John at Good Samaritan Hospital, did also testify that John was unresponsive, intubated, hypothermic, and in cardiac arrest with no pulse. Justin Rice would also be the person who would order the blood alcohol test on Karen, who had been brought to the hospital under a Section 12 order. She had a blood alcohol content of 0.93 which of course is over the legal limit of 
Nicholas Roberts, who is a member of the Massachusetts Office of Alcohol Testing at Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab, discussed retrograde testing, a method used to estimate a person's blood alcohol level at an earlier time, using 1245 as the estimated time of the last drink consumed, Roberts estimated her blood alcohol level would have been between 0.135% and 0.292%. During cross-examination, the accuracy of the estimation was questioned, noting that if Karen continued to drink after 12.45 a.m., the results would be inaccurate. Medical examiner Dr. Renee Stonebridge said John's injuries could come from either a fall or a traffic collision. And another medical examiner, Dr. Arini Scordi Bello, described the autopsy findings and noted that the manner of death was undetermined as she did not have enough information. She noted that the injuries are not immediately lethal, but he could have been incapacitated. She said John's injuries could come from a fall, being hit with a blunt object, or even being hit with a car. When asked if the injuries are consistent with being hit by a car at 24 miles per hour, she said, it's likely, but also unlikely at the same time. Now with that all said, we once again come to that July 1st mistrial. After the jury being deadlocked after several days of deliberations, writing twice to the judge that they cannot reach a verdict, the jury sent one final note, writing that fundamental differences in their beliefs are making it nearly impossible to reach a unanimous verdict. So, as for now, we will continue to follow this story and hope that we will find something out in January 2025 because that is the only thing that I can see scheduled for her next trial.